Then a lot of them, when we had the long hikes, uh, fell down, fell apart at the seams due to the, uh, the long hikes that we had. Couldn't stand, uh, stand the, you know, we'd come off a 60-mile hike and your boots were full of blood uh, or perspiration, if you will. <laughs> Each man had to be qualified with every weapon, and special firing ranges were built at Fort Harrison. In late September, demolitions experts and explosives arrived. We were taught how to uh, arm, uh, I think they called it RS, it was an explosive uh, forerunner, I think, of the new plastic explosives. And uh, we blew up some bridges around Helena here. They blew up quite a few things they shouldn't have, I guess. Whole <laughs> mining shacks, and little bridges, and all kinds of stuff, you know. A former detective and officer from the Shanghai International Police came in to teach hand-to-hand -hand combat. Pat O'Neill taught the force a simpler type of fighting than judo. Unarmed combat, the kicks, dirty fighting, really dirty fighting. All the dirty fighting you can think of, you know. And he taught us all the dirty kicks and the dirty fighting with your fingers and your hands. In late fall, ski training begins with long hikes carrying ski poles. That was to get our arms and legs in shape. We'd, uh, for example, over here is uh, Hogback Mountain. And they took us clear behind Hogback Mountain in trucks. We spent the night and then we hiked back about 40 miles with full packs and uh, with these sticks like ski poles and we had to work those all the way well after 40 miles of that you're in pretty good shape snow came to the helena valley in december of 1942 and the final cold weather training begins norwegian ski instructors are brought in to complete the training training began slowly but by the end of the second week all the men had completed the course not all enjoyed the so-called torture boards on the long cross-country treks that was strenuous. That was, that was a lot of work. Skiing's not easy, really. And ours would have to be, I'm sure, described as, as uh, cross-country rather than downhill type of skiing. They take us uphill all day. I mean, every place you went was uphill. And the only time you went to come downhill was coming the last half a mile into camp. Then you'd ski down there. You know, and that's when all the guys would collapse on the hill. Advanced ski training took the force to higher slopes at Blossburg on the Continental Divide near Helena. The higher into the mountains they went, the colder it got. But that was a cold winter in 43, you bet. It got uh, 30, 40 below zero many times. The Norwegians made us strip to the waist and scrub each other's backs and our chest with snow to get acclimatized uh, <laughs> after daybreak. And, and so that... Uh, uh, I think that uh, got us acclimatized to the cold weather real quick. By the end of February, the instructors reported that 95% of the force could ski up to Norwegian Army standards. As ski training continued, the men began work with a specially designed combat vehicle called the Weasel that was developed for use in the snow. All winter, all types of training, they towed us behind the Weasels on ski and took us up on the passes, Mullen Pass all through the hills. Lots of training, and we all had to drive them too, you know, handle them. It was a kind of a temperamental little machine. Uh, it had a couple of drawbacks. One of them, they would throw a track, even though the tracks were about 18 inches wide. If you made a sharp, tried to make a sharp turn, well, you could throw a track very easily. So you had to learn how to put it back on, which took a bit of doing. Training continued day after day, but the troops did have weekends off, and they made the best of the free time. Always Saturday morning parade. Everybody cleaned up, shaved, and, and uh, appeared on parade, and by 10 to 11 o'clock, I think 11 o'clock, it was, it was dispersed, and then you were on your own. Did a lot of walking, and I went to uh, mine shafts and visited mine shafts, and, and uh, in the wintertime I skied. Uh, We'd sightsee, go to Butte, go to the old Rocky Mountain Cafe to have dinner. Uh, a lot of them would go on hikes, even. Uh, it was just the shape we were in. We just wanted to see it as much as we could. Went to town, danced all night, drank all night, played all night, went to Butte, 
four great calls, you know. Had fun, that's all. A special relationship developed between the townspeople and the members of the force. Helena adopted the force as its own. The relationships remained even as the troops left for battle and for many years after. If anybody d did not become acquainted with the citizenry of Helena, it was their fault because the, the people of Helena were certainly generous with their time, uh, with their homes, uh, with their daughters, with their vehicles. They treated us really great. And that's why all the force members really love Helena. Even the ones that didn't come back here always want to come back, you know, and they do. And they keep in touch with a lot of people here. The town people were so enthusiastic about the unit being here that uh, they would come out uh, in their cars on a Saturday and uh, pick us up and take us to their homes and feed us Sunday dinners particularly. That's why this has always been considered the home of the force. You know, many, many, many homes were open to, to force members, particularly on weekends. Like soldiers everywhere, many of the men captured the hearts of the local young women. Nearly 200 marriages were performed. Well, personally, I, I was one of the first ones in the force to get married. We weren't supposed to be married when we arrived. We were supposed to be single. Well, I got married on a Thursday, Saturday, Another couple got married, and, and it, it snowballed. And before we were through, there were quite a few married ones when we were all supposed to be single. April 6, 1943. It was time to go, and the force marched down the streets of Helena for the last time. Among those on the reviewing stand are Colonel Frederick and Montana's governor, Sam Ford. It was a tearful goodbye for both the troops and the city. I just got married, so I had a lot of thoughts, but uh, of course we expected it. Just kind of sad, you know, leaving, that's all. Otherwise, we knew what we were kind of anxious to get going. My, my wife was pregnant, and I had a lot of mixed feelings about leaving at that time, but uh, there, there was no choice. Uh, we hated to leave Helena. Well, it was pretty tearful, everybody. Uh, we knew we were leaving, and... Uh, uh, all our good friends among the civilian people, uh, the citizens of Helena. Yeah, it was, it was heartrending uh, at times, and the goodbyes. But that's war. I had to go. I knew I was coming back, period. The force headed to the East Coast for amphibious training and then to war first in the Aleutian Islands, and then in Italy and southern France. The legend of the force was made in Italy on the beachhead at Anzio. Soldiers blackened their faces and went behind German lines at night. Using daggers, they cut their enemies' throats and earned the nickname the Black Devil's Brigade. One entry in the diary of a dead German soldier read, the Black Devils are all around us every time we come into the line. We never hear them come. Each time the Devil's Brigade went behind enemy lines, they left stickers on dead Nazis that said, the worst is yet to come. The first Special Service Force was the first Allied unit to enter Rome. Mark Radcliffe led the task force that first entered the Holy City on June 4, 1944, just two days before the Allied invasion of France. After the liberation of Italy, they moved into southern France. With the Allied forces well on their way to victory in Europe, the War Department decided that a special binational commando unit was no longer needed. On December 5, 1944, the force ranked up for the final time, and as the Canadians broke rank and marched away, the first special service force was gone. What began at dusty Fort Harrison in Helena, Montana, ended halfway around the world in southern France. The war took its toll on the unit. Over 2,300 men had been wounded, and over 400 were missing in action or killed. On the way home from Europe, the now separate American and Canadian units created the first Special Service Force Association, keeping at least the memory alive. 